thank you and uh, good morning. My talk, is, as you know, today will be about my book, The Moral Foundation of uh, Economic Behavior. I won't be able to cover the whole book, obviously, or even the entire argument, but I will hit what I hope are enough highlights to uh, get your interest. So uh, what's the headline? Uh, this, the arguments in the book are fairly complicated, so it's helpful to kind of know where we're going before we get there. Uh, the headline. Um, is, as you just heard, the moral beliefs can and likely do play an important role in the development and operation of free market societies. Now, this is not something that would be considered uh, earth-shaking to most normal people, but to most economists or social scientists or political scientists, uh, this would be kind of a heretical claim to make. Uh, what's the main takeaway? Well, it wasn't my objective to reach this conclusion at the beginning. I really went into it with a complete open mind. But uh, in the end, I came around to concluding uh, that no single factor better explains the differential success of societies uh, than the moral beliefs of the people who comprise them. Uh, those of you who are familiar with David Landis's work on the wealth and poverty of nations know that he has a great quote that says, uh, if economic history teaches us anything, it's that culture makes almost all the difference. Again, a claim that normal people would say, mm, that may kind of make sense to me, but economists, social scientists, uh, political scientists, to them, ooh, no, no, that, that can't be right. That's, that's too likely to tread on, on politically incorrect water. So what's the elevator pitch? Kind of the summary. I've, you, you know, if you're, if you're doing big work, you always got to wonder about what will happen if you get on an elevator with a Nobel Prize winner who can help you. So you have 90 seconds to get his attention. Uh, so the elevator pitch here is pretty simple. Uh, maximizing general prosperity requires minimizing transaction costs. And I provide new arguments for why this requires us to be able to genu genuinely trust each other in large group contexts. Um, we're not hardwired to produce high trust societies. That's why high trust societies are in fact extremely rare. Um, and uh, we can't create them out of institutions either. Uh, they can only be produced by culture in a form of moral beliefs that possess specific characteristics. The point of the book is to identify characteristics that moral beliefs have to have if they are to produce a high trust society, which in turn produces low transaction cost environment, which in turn maximizes the number of transactions through which we can uh, create prosperity. So let's get right into it, prosperity and opportunism. Um, economics is basically um, trying to understand a pattern of resource allocation in society. And that's what, we, that's what we're all about. And the fundamental insight of economics is that the pattern of resource allocation we observe in society is a product of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of transactions. Way too many to be able to ever figure out. Uh, it's just far too complex. Transactions are governed by benefits and costs. And there are two types of benefits that occasion transactions. The first is the gains from exchange. And you all know about that. Anybody knows anything, anything about economics knows all about the gains from exchange. The second type of transaction, uh, the second benefit that occasions transactions is gains from cooperation. Gains from cooperation are come earlier in human development and are more important than gains from exchange uh, and are more fundamental even to a modern economy, and yet uh, very little work is done on the gains from cooperation in the professional literature. So what's the gains from cooperation? Pretty simple. Alone I make 10 units, alone you make 10 units. Together we make not 20, but 26. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. A great deal has been written about cooperation over the years, <coughs> but all of it is utterly moot if we don't have this positive sum quality of cooperation. It's an iron law of cooperation. Uh, I wrote a paper, couple, uh, paper a couple of years ago that worked all this out, uh, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. I don't remember when it came out. But. Now, one thing that's really cool about cooperative transactions is if you think about what, it, what the rules of the game are in a free market society, in free market society, we only allow voluntary transactions. I mean, I shouldn't say that. There's a, we allow a few involuntary transactions. But the lion's share of transactions are voluntary. Now, if transactions are voluntary, they must be mutually beneficial. People won't enter into transactions and make them worse off. They have to make them better off. Well, then that means then that we have to have some kind of benefit that makes the whole greater than the sum of the parts, just as cooperation does. That extra six units, the 26 minus 20, 
represents a cooperative surplus that makes it possible for him to take 13, me to take 13. We both are 30% better off than we were working alone. That's a hallmark of voluntary transaction activity. In a world where we don't have voluntary transactions, it's entirely possible for somebody to force me to cooperate with him. And alone I make 10, alone he makes 10, and together uh, we make 18. We know a bunch of societies that have tried that. It doesn't work. It's a bad idea. Now, one thing that's really neat about this as well is if you think about it from society's point of view, the transactions that you want to occur are the ones that add to most the total output. I mean, the name of the game is maximize general prosperity, have the most stuff per person. Now, what does that? Well, what does that is piling up these surpluses. And there's two ways to do that. Make the surpluses as big as possible and have as many of the transactions that produce these surpluses as possible. Big surpluses plus a lot of surpluses equals a lot of aggregate surplus, same number of people, more output per person. So, alone I make 10, alone you make 10, together we make 26. Alone I make 10, alone you make 10, together we make 30. And suppose I can either transact with you or you. I can't do both. From my point of view, which one am I going to pick? <coughs> well, splitting a 30, it's 15. 15 is better than 13. It's one I'm going to pick. From a benevolent social dictator's point of view, whose sole objective is to maximize general prosperity, which one do we want to have happen? This one. We're going to have the most total output per person. So private incentives are aligned with social welfare perfectly in a voluntary type of economic uh, situation. Now, cooperation. Exactly where does that come from? Well, there's all kinds of arguments for why there could be a cooperative surplus. But by far and away the most important one is the one that was offered by Adam Smith. Adam Smith explained that when people work together, they can effectuate gains from specialization through the division of labor. You guys all know that story. Certainly, uh, many of you may even know of the specific example in the Wealth of Nations uh, about the pin factory. Now, I have, I have a question. Uh, and I, feel free to answer. Does anybody know what the increase in uh, productivity uh, per person that occurred in the pin factory example? So in other words, he compared a situation where you had one guy working alone to a situation where you have 10 people working together. And, and, and you can compute from his example what the increase in productivity is. Anybody care to guess what it was? 50%, 100%, 200%? 50%. 50%? <laughs> <laughs> You're a little low. Uh, if you work out the math, and I've done it many times, it is 23,900%. No. So the gains from specialization is not some small little detail that's mentioned in a little book that we all kind of like. It is absolutely fundamental. This is why if you had 10 Nobel Prize winners on a deserted island, they couldn't even make a toaster. <laughs> they couldn't. It'd be impossible. It'd be ab and you all know why. There's just not enough people to work with to produce all the constituent parts and so on and so forth. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Without specialization, we're dead in the water. Most human beings would be dead within a week or so if they didn't have other humans to work with and specialize with. We are a group species. But if we're going to specialize, we have to transact. I mean, if I'm going to do one thing, and then nine of you are going to do nine other things, so the 10 things I need are all going to be done uh, across all 10 of us, then I'm going to have to trade the one thing I do for the other nine you do. There's no avoiding it. To enjoy the gains of specialization, we have to transact. Transaction behavior and specialization go hand in hand. Here's the rub. Whenever we transact with other human beings, we almost always open ourselves to opportunity. That pro provides a pretext for someone to take advantage of us in some way. Now, some transactions, that doesn't happen very much. You know, a spot market transaction, that doesn't happen very much. Which is one reason why you see plenty of spot market transactions in the third world. Because there's a lot of opportunism, but those are the only kind of transactions that, that can survive for that reason. But complex transactions of the type that we do in the United States, uh, no way. Not going to happen. So, <laughs> opportunism is the most fundamental impediment to economic development in the world by far, and you can see how it absolutely strikes to the heart of economic prosperity. Opportunism gets in the way of transactions. Without transactions, we can't specialize. Without specialization, we're dead in the water. 
Now, what that means then is if there's a moral problem to be solved as it relates to the economy, it's not getting people to do what needs to be done. There's ample incentive for people to undertake the transactions that add most to general prosperity. So the moral dues are important from a moral point of view, but from an economic point of view, the moral dues really don't have anything to do. They have no role to play. However, if there's a moral problem to be solved, there's no question that getting people to refrain from opportunism would be useful for the economy because opportunism is an absolute impediment to transaction behavior and therefore gets in the way of prosperity. So the moral dues may be important in terms of morality in of itself, but in terms of economic growth and development, they're not. It's the moral don'ts that matter. All right, let's talk a little bit about group size. Adam Smith didn't just point out that specialization is important. He also pointed out that the larger the groups within which we cooperate, exchange, etc., uh, the more productive we are. So the gains of specialization don't just rise to group size, they rise exponentially. Um, we're looking at about a fourth degree polynomial if you work out the math on that. So bigger is better, and it's not a little better, it's a lot better. But here's the problem. What I show in the book is that the problem of opportunism worsens dramatically, indeed exponentially, with group size as well. Now why is that the case? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Why are humans organizing in large groups? What's the point? The point is to effectuate the gains of specialization. That's the whole point. But the more we specialize, the truer it is that each of us possesses limited knowledge of what we do, of the specifics of time and place, what Hayek called local knowledge, while most everyone else in the enterprise really doesn't know what we do. I mean, they may know what we do in terms of a title, but they really don't know how we do what we do moment to moment. No way. Now, why does that matter? Well, if I'm the only person who knows all of the details of time and place associated with what I do in a narrow area in the firm, I'm the only person who can really evaluate whether I'm taking actions that are in the best interest of the firm or actions that are in my own best interest. Just think about it. If you were a scoundrel, would you want to be in a group of 10 people or would you want to be in a corporation with 5,000 employees? You want to hide out in a corporation of 5,000 employees because there's a, there are many interstices within which you can hide and you can be in a situation where nobody really knows what you're doing. So you can take actions that are in your own best interest, not the firm's best interest, and there's no way for the firm to ever really figure that out. This creates opportunities for you to behave opportunistically, take advantage of the knowledge asymmetry that's there, without any chance of being caught, what I call third degree opportunism. Uh, Bob Frank calls this uh, golden opportunities. An opportunity to engage in opportunism with no chance of being caught. So, the greater localization of knowledge creates more golden opportunities. More golden opportunities, of course, creates more opportunism. Mm -hmm. The second big problem is uh, there's weaker natural moral restraint. And I'm going to get, this, that's a big part of what I'm going to do today, so I'm not going to dwell on it right now. The so bottom line is to have large and entrepreneurial firms, which are, which are the engines of, of, of economic prosperity. We need to be able to delegate decision-making discretion throughout firms so that individuals who possess local knowledge are able to use it to the fullest extent possible to advance the firm's interest. You know, in human history, we've had big things. We've had them for a long time. There's no shortage of big things. Think Roman army. In human history, we've had entrepreneurial behavior. That goes way back. But only very, very, very recently have we had really, really big things that were also entrepreneurial. Before it was always either or. Also, only very, very, very recently have we had anything that looks anything like general prosperity. This is not a coincidence. Now, here's the rub. If the reason why people are reluctant to behave opportunistically it's because of some standard neoclassical argument that it's in their own rational self-interest to refrain from opportunism, blah, blah, blah. Then they'll only have prudential restraint. There'll be no moral element to their restraint. The problem with prudential restraint is, is the hardcore logic that produces it is exactly the same logic that compels them to take advantage of every single golden opportunity comes along. So prudential restraint produces trust, but it produces trust that falls down on the job precisely where we need trust the most. 
I mean, that's, that's when we need to be able to trust. We need to be able to trust somebody when there's no way to figure out what they did after the fact. That's real trust. That's genuine trust. So prudential restraint, which is the way that economists and social scientists generally would like to rationalize uh, moral forbearance, really doesn't produce moral restraint. <clears throat> As a result, it, if, if people's reluctance to behave opportunistically is limited to prudential restraint, that's effectuated by institutions and mechanisms of monitoring and so on and so forth, that tends to produce a trade-off between size and entrepreneurship. And that trade-off ends up being a huge impediment to economic development. <laughs> Moral restraint, in other words, not behaving opportunistically because you think it's wrong, and it's wrong whether anybody can see you or not, can release this break on development by making it possible to delegate decision-making discretion all the way up and down a firm's hierarchy, even if we're talking about a very, very, very large firm. So moral restraint is the name of the game. If we can't, don't have moral restraint, we're not going to be able to deal with the golden opportunity problem. So how do we effectuate moral restraint? I nominate guilt. One way to get people from behaving opportunistically is to simply drive up the cost of opportunism. By the way, in my entire framework, there's absolutely nothing irrational. The entire model is completely rational. Moral behavior and, and rationality are not at war with one another, unless you can't think clearly. If you think clearly, there's no problem at all. But if you leave important things out of the story, yes, you can convince yourself that morality and rationality are at war. But guilt is one of those important things that were left out. If you put it back in, there's no problem at all. To deal with golden opportunities, we need something that works even without any chance of detection, something internalized like guilt. Uh, Bob Frank argued uh, that that's why uh, trust is, has to ultimately be based on moral taste. They have, uh, in other words, trust has to be based on something that's antecedent to rational decision making. Otherwise, you're going to have what, what I call a prudence problem. You're going to always come back to this problem of if it's a golden opportunity, it's in your best interest to act on it. So, so you have to not act on those golden opportunities for a reason that has nothing to do with rational calculation. It has to go all the way back to taste. Um, the higher proportion of people who have moral taste that make them reluctant to behave opportunistically, the more likely we'll have a high trust society and therefore a low transaction cost environment and therefore a great number of transactions through which to effectuate the gains from specialization and pile up these surpluses to have the most stuff per person. Well, <clears throat> moral restraint dominates prudential restraint by solving the prudence problem. But even moral restraint is not enough. Why we are more, feel like we're morally restrained also matters. In other words, why you believe opportunism is immoral also matters. This is a really, really important point. We are genetically hardwired to be reluctant to take advantage of other people. The vast majority of humans over the vast majority of societies and the vast majority of human history have been reluctant to behave opportunistically with regard to their fellow man the vast majority of times because we know we'll feel guilty if we do, because we don't like harming people. Now, there are some people that don't feel that way. They're very scary. They should be imprisoned immediately. But that's a, that's a very small number of people. Most of us don't behave opportunistically most of the time because we don't want to harm other people. And that's great. I'm happy for, for you for feeling that way. Uh, I wouldn't want to live in a society where it's not true. My, my, my point isn't that harm-based moral restraint is a bad thing. My point is, is that if wrongfulness is derived solely from harmfulness, then in large group settings, exactly the kind of settings where we effectuate these huge gains in specialization, in large group settings, many acts of opportunism will simply not feel wrong. Simple example. It's tax time. You're filling out your taxes. I don't know about you, but if I exaggerate a couple deductions on my Schedule A of my 1040, I could easily get my refund up by another thousand bucks. I don't know about you, I notice another thousand dollars. And I get all thousand for me. Now, if I don't think I'm going to get caught, so if we just set that aside for the moment, and if the only reason why I'm reluctant to do wrong things is because I know I'll feel guilty because I'll hurt somebody, then I am going to exaggerate that deduction. Why? 
Because no single human being on the planet is harmed by that action. No way, not even close. We're talking about way less than one cent of effect on anyone. It is confusion to think that anyone will be harmed. If no one's harmed, there's no one to empathize, sympathize, and therefore feel guilty about having harm. The larger the group, and the more we spread the cost of the opportunism over the whole group, the more likely it is the case that there will simply be no one to feel guilty about having harm. So harm-based moral restraint is a wonderful thing, but it's not enough. This idea that in very large groups, our ability to empathize with an individual who's been harmed uh, is something that I call the empathy problem. And I believe that the empathy problem is the, one of the most fundamental impediments to human flourishing generally. The key to solving the empathy, obviously, if we don't deal with the empathy problem, what are we going to have? Well, we're going to have what most societies have always been. Most societies in the world are not very prosperous. And part of the reason why is what the people may be individually very warm. If you go to Russia, for example, there is no lack of trust. And there is no lack of decency. If you know the individual, they'll give you the shirt off the back. The problem is, if you have a corporation of 10,000 people and you turn your back, what happens? In a very few societies in human history, you're able to turn your back and not worry. But in most societies, it's the other way around. You know, in the United States, we do something that's just absolutely insane. Every day, every day, there are people who are told, you're on your way out. Middle level managers, we think we need to move in a new direction. And very often, these people will stay in their job for another month or so. And the people who've essentially fired them will not worry that they're going to destroy the firm or whatever. They'll just say, well, he, he wouldn't do that. The rest of the world says, are you insane? Now think about what kind of society can do that. Well, the kind of society can do that is one that has very, 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 very high trust. And that's very, very rare. And I'm explaining exactly why it's rare. So how do we solve the empathy problem? The key to solving the empathy problem is to somehow attach guilt directly to the action itself rather than to its consequences. In other words, we have to believe that doing certain things that we normally re regard as being wrong, doing certain things is inherently wrong even if no one is harmed. So in other words, it's wrong as a matter of principle. Some of you may remember when you were a kid, you may have cheated or stole something when you were really little. And your mom just, you know, what did you do? You know, and he said, well, I just took this. No, you didn't just take it. You stole it. Yeah, but he's got, he, he, he didn't even, he didn't even know because, this, you know, nobody got hurt. I mean, he's got like 40 Easter eggs. I only took one. He didn't even know he had 40. And then your mother said, that's not the point. You're still a thief. We don't steal. Stealing's wrong period. That is ex actually in human history a very recent way of thinking and across societies even today a very rare way of thinking. This produces what I call principled moral restraint. Now a really important point about the empathy problem is neither increasing moral earnestness, our desire to be a moral person, nor increasing concern for others can solve the empathy problem. It doesn't have any effect whatsoever. Um, wanting to really be moral can actually make the empathy problem worse, and we can return to this uh, during the Q&A if you want to. Concern for others doesn't make any difference. Remember, the empathy problem is antecedent to the effects on people's uh, welfare. If I, if I have, if the reason why my concern is going to matter is because I care about you and therefore don't want to harm you, then the empathy problem is not going to be solved by driving up the concern because you weren't harmed. The whole point is no harm ever happened in the first place. This is really important because modern approaches to character and morals education, a la Sandy McDonald and endowed chairs and so on and so forth, at the K through 12 level emphasize ginning up uh, moral earnestness and concern for others as a way to solve all our moral problems. It, it's not enough. I'm not against it at the margin, but it's not enough. When it acts as a substitute for principle moral restraint, that is extremely dangerous. The key point here is that our hardwired psychological mechanisms that evolved to make it possible for us to trust each other in small groups, and we were lived in small groups for the first 99.999% of our existence, those mechanisms are not scalable. 
They work in small groups because that's exactly the milieu within which they evolve. But when you try to apply them to large groups, they do not work. And if you insist on applying them to large groups, you'll find soon that you'll be living back in a small group with a small group payoff. Well, you know what? You'd think that we'd be done. We're not. Even principled moral restraint is not enough. Why? Okay, suppose I do something to harm you. Okay, and I'm thinking, I'm, you know, it's an act of opportunism and it'll be at your expense. All right? And suppose I have no illusions. I, I, I'm not saying, oh, well, I, I feel, I, I'll feel bad if it hurts you, but I won't feel bad if it doesn't. No, 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 no. I feel bad about hurting you as a matter of principle. And so it produces a certain level of guilt. Pick a number, say 10. If I do that, and I haven't done it yet, but if I do that, I know I'm going to feel guilty at about number 10. Now, suppose I can undertake a positive moral action, do some nice thing for you. And it's, a, and it's not a small thing. It's a really important thing, like a kidney to save your life. I don't know. That's good. <laughs> so if I could do it and I don't do it, I would feel very guilty, like about a 40. And suppose the only way to do that for you is to cheat you. Principle of moral restraint doesn't beat that problem. We still have the problem of I might feel morally obliged to engage in greater good redistribution. So I may feel like it's a moral imperative that I cheat you and, do, and therefore do what I have to do to make you better off. There are many people who think this way. You've heard people say things to you uh, using this kind of language. But here's the problem. Even if by some ultimate moral standard, let's say a thousand years from now, we all figure out, ah, we got it all figured out, we figured out moral philosophy, it's done. We got, we got this grand theory of religion and moral philosophy, it all comes together, and that was the right thing to do. It's beside the point. If we live in a society in which I'm able to make this calculation, he can't trust me. If he can't trust me, there are transactions that he and I might have done that we can't do. So we need to solve this greater good rationalization problem in some way. The way to do it is to subordinate the obedience of exhortations to take positive moral actions, helping people be nice, subordinate that to the obedience of moral prohibitions against negative moral actions. That doesn't mean that this isn't important. This is hugely important. But it does mean there's a bright line between them. Don't talk to me about how moral somebody is because they did nice things if they're over here doing this. There's two steps to being moral. First and foremost, don't do the don'ts. If and only if you've done that, then we'll talk about how many do's you've done. So how moral you are is a matter of degree, but it's not completely a matter of degree. There's this qualitative in or out part of the moral don'ts. Moral don'ts come first and foremost. That I call lexical primacy. Now. When moral beliefs combine principled moral restraint with lexical primacy, moral restraint takes on a duty-like quality, which I call duty-based moral restraint. That brings us to the moral foundation. Uh, the moral foundation of economic behavior is a norm of unconditional trustworthiness. doesn't mean that every single person is trustworthy, but the vast majority of people are trustworthy in most circumstances. Made possible by a preponderance of people possessing an ethic of duty-based moral restraint while not regarding moral advocacy as a moral duty. Now that last phrase, you might say, well, well wait a minute, you didn't talk about that. Well, how did that sneak in? Well, suppose I'm convinced that undertaking certain <coughs> positive moral actions is a duty. Just suppose that's the case. So I abide by duty-based moral advocacy, which is, by the way, important because many charitable organizations try to make this argument that you have a duty to do this sort of thing. Well, if we get ourselves in a situation in which the only way to undertake a positive moral action is to cheat somebody, then we'll have conflicting moral imperatives. I have a duty to do this, and I have a duty to do that. If I do this, I've broken that duty. If I do this, I've broken that duty. Well, that's not much of a moral theory. And the bottom line, from our point of view, is this duty here will erode that duty. Eroding that duty will erode trust. Eroding trust will erode our ability to transact. Eroding our ability to transact will reduce the amount of resources we have in society and the amount of resources that we have in society, which is now lower, which will mean we have less to do good.
So in the long run, it's a loser anyway. So what that means then is that most moral philosophers have it wrong. The kind of moral beliefs that do the best job giving us the good life are neither thoroughly non-consequentialist or thoroughly consequentialist. Consequentialist just means based on the actual outcome. Non-consequentialist means as a matter of principle. When it comes to negative moral actions, we need people to have steadfast principle moral restraint. No. Period. Don't want to hear the story. I don't lie. I don't. But if we just killed these three little girls, we would be. I don't want to hear that crap. No. The answer is no. We just don't do it. However, it is equally important that positive moral action not be non consequentialist. It has to be consequentialist in order to subordinate it to moral restraint. And it's only when we do that that we maximize our ability to trust each other. When so many people abide by the moral foundation that it's irrational to not trust others in all but the most exceptional circumstances, a high trust society emerges. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, let's go down the list. In a high trust society, we can transact with others with a little fear, even those who don't particularly care about us. In most of the world, the only people you can trust are people that you know care about you, which is why in most of the world, you have low trust, low development, but very warm cultures. Think about it. In the societies where you can trust other people the most reflexively, people are the coldest. Literally and figuratively, if you think about it, Scandinavia, right? Um, in high trust society, we can enjoy the benefits of having high trust dependent institutions. Uh, I, I have many friends who are Nobel Prize winners in institutional school. And you know they want to think that it's all about institutions, it's all about institutions, it's all about institutions. Okay, fine. But many of the institutions that we take for granted in the United States fall flat on their face in most of the rest of the world. Why? Because they're trust dependent. The bottom line is, is if you don't have a culture that can provide a foundation for your institutions, then your institutional foundation isn't going to work either. You have to keep working upstream. And you, the ultimate thing is having the right cultural foundation in the form of the right kind of moral beliefs. High trust societies don't waste a lot of resources on safeguarding. That's nice. That leaves more resources for HGTV. And finally, and most importantly, and you know, I could do an entire talk just on this one topic, high trust societies allow us to have firms that are large on the one hand to effectuate Smithian gains but utterly entrepreneurial all the way up and down the firm's hierarchy and the other to effectuate Hayekian and Kersenarian gains. We get it both. We can have both. I want to talk a little bit about culture now. I've made the case that we need certain kinds of moral beliefs in order to produce a high trust society and we need a high trust society in order to have the kind of life we take for granted today. But is there a way to get such moral beliefs in the people? Um, I argue that external mechanisms like shaming and institutions simply aren't going to be enough uh, because we need moral, moral restraint, and that's because we have the, the golden opportunity problem. Uh, yeah, golden opportunity problem. What we can't do, though, is what Bob Frank does. This is where Bob Frank and I really part company. Um, we can't choose our moral beliefs for ourselves. If we do, we get into a rational catch-22 problem. The neoclassical view would say, well, it is in your own best interest to behave in a morally respectable way because it'll give you a reputation for honest dealing, blah, 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 right? Well, if that's true, then when a genuine golden opportunity comes along, the very hard-edged logic that brought you to the conclusion that you should behave in this morally respectable way says, well, here's your chance, idiot. <laughs> so, if we choose our moral beliefs for ourselves, if they aren't genuine taste, but are in fact just a product of a strategic calculation, then trust will fall down exactly where you need it. I don't need to trust you if I can watch you 24-7. I need to trust you with $10,000 when you go to a third world country in cash on marked bills. That's when I need to trust you. That's when you'll take it. So we have to solve this rationality catch-22 problem. How do we do that? Well, actually, culture solves the problem perfectly, and it solves the problem perfectly in a way that's unique to culture. Why? Well, what's the hallmark of culture? It's teaching and learning across generations. So what's happening with acculturation is children are not really choosing what they believe so much as they are absorbing 
what they believe. By the time they become adults, how they feel about certain things, some of their reflexive reactions, take on the quality of taste just as much as I like chocolate and I don't like chocolate based on the fraction. I mean, if you ask a child who's been properly raised, uh, hey, what do you think about stealing? He said, well, I, I think it's wrong. Okay, well, let's talk about that a little bit. So, do you think it's wrong because it hurts people? Well, uh, certainly I don't like hurting people. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could steal this and nobody would get hurt. If the child was raised properly in the American way, I would say the child would say, well, I, uh, no, you, you, it's still wrong. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but that's devil talk. I mean, that's, you know, I, you, I know what you're doing. You're spinning some kind of web, and I'm going to get stuck in it. No, no, I don't, I don't do that crap. And indeed, if you press a little further, you'll find that the, that the kid will say, well, even if nobody gets hurt, I'll still be a thief. I don't want to be a thief. In other words, you can see <coughs> virtue character developing. It's about the actual self-perception of the individual. So culture solves this rationality catch-22 problem in a way that uh, nothing else can. I also show that in evolutionarily stable strategy, equilibrium, the getting to a truly high trust society, you, know, you can work out the mathematics of what it takes to get to uh, a situation in which there is a convention of presumptive extension of trust. And I show that only culture can get past this little wall. But there's no way we can do that here. So culture matters, not just because moral beliefs matter and moral beliefs are part of culture. Culture also matters instrumentally. Some final thoughts. Uh, empathy is the foundation of our of basic decency, no question about it. Gustav Gilbert is correct. The absence of empathy is the root of all evil. I got it. Necessary, but not sufficient. Empathy is great, but it's not enough. Institutions sharply reduce transaction costs. That's terrific. But only moral beliefs can produce a genuinely high trust society, which reduces transaction costs the most. By engendering trust, moral foundation allows us to avert the normally inevitable trade-off between size and entrepreneurship. One of the key points of the book is that what matters most is not the list of moral values, moral earnestness, or even concern for others. These things are important, but when it comes to providing support for a free market society, they really don't matter. What really matters most is how moral beliefs affect the way we think about morality. Do our moral beliefs make us believe that principled moral restraint matters? And do our moral beliefs produce a bright line between positive and negative moral action so we have lexical primacy of obedience of moral prohibition? All kinds of different beliefs could generate that structure, but you've got to have that kind of logical structure between the values. The list of values doesn't matter. In fact, the list of values is almost the same across all societies. How the values are organized in your brain is what differs across societies, and how that organization is effectuated is what produces trust or doesn't produce trust. Poor people in poor societies are not poor because they're insufficiently moral or because they value the wrong things. That's not a problem. The way they think is the problem. Some of the poorest societies on the planet have some of the highest <coughs> IQs. The problem is not that they're stupid. The problem is the kind of moral beliefs they have are producing habits of mind that make it impossible for them to produce a high trust society and therefore to produce the kinds of institutions that we take for granted. Unlike genes, policies, and institutions, differences in moral beliefs can explain differences in trust and economic performance across society. Uh, I have more, but I think I'm more than flat out of time. So I would uh, thank you for your attention and like to open it up for questions. Well, need to have sounds like necessary, but not sufficient. Think of the Chinese family. I've done a fair amount of work on China and Chinese economic development. Especially if you go back, say, 50 years, you're not going to see a stronger family. I mean, oh, wasn't that great? Couldn't we have strong families like that? Well, no, wait a minute. In China, especially 50 years ago, I'm not talking about right now. Things are in such change right now that we've got too many moving parts in that story. But go back 50 years ago. In China, if you get cut off from your family, you're screwed. You, there's no hope. Why? Because in China, you have a low trust society. 
the trust that exists exists only from mutual affection, from concern for others that you know. So once you're outside of your circle of trust, as Frank Fukuyama puts it, nobody will trust you with anything that involves any kind of responsibility. Well, if that's true, it's hard to make money if you can only do stuff that doesn't require any kind of trust. So I would argue that emphasis on family, you want to know another place where you hear a lot about families? Sicily. <laughs> What's going on there is familial ties are substituting for formal thought that can produce trust across the whole society. And I would argue even further, I was born up in a family that's very traditionally, Amer very old-fashioned American you know, kind of family. I belong to a family that is uniquely American in the following sense. For the last 200 years in America, we have a proud tradition of young men telling their dad where he can stick it, walking out the door, and never seeing them again. And then those young men go on and make a good life. Now you might say, well, that's a terrible thing. No, it's not. Because that means if the family holds itself together through time, it's from genuine love, genuine care. You don't need your parents to open doors for you. You don't need your uncle. You love your parents. I don't think you understood my question. Uh, well, I think I probably did. But go ahead. <laughs> my question really had more to do with the source of the moral. I mean, I know you talked about uh, a natural moral code, which is like in, in, integral to a person. But where would you expect the person to get this moral anchor? Institutionally? No. Or from the family? From the family. There. That's why I said necessary but not sufficient. Now, when I say necessary but not sufficient, I really mean it. I just don't go on and on about it. Uh, yeah. He's been picked on a lot, so he could say <laughs> Did I hear you say that golden opportunities are bad? No. Um, golden opportunities are problematic. Um, if, suppose we live in a world and golden opportunities never existed for some strange reason and it didn't affect the kinds of transactions we could undertake. Well, we'd be better off than, than, than having them exist. But the bottom line is that's like trying to get taller and thinner at the same time. The, the kinds of transactions that we want to be able to undertake are going to involve levels of complexity that are going to produce interstices of local knowledge that are going to produce golden opportunities. That's just the way it is. That's just the way life in the real world yeah. So golden opportunities are a problem that has to be dealt with in a society that has a complex <coughs> type of production arrangement in large groups. In societies that don't have, the causation runs the other way though, if you want to think about it in terms of economic history and development. <coughs> societies that are low trust can't deal with golden opportunity problems. So they have to deal with golden opportunities by obviating them through institutions that just don't give you the room to do it. There's a word for it. Begins with a B. That's what a bureaucracy is. Bureaucracy, the, the essence of a bureaucracy <clears throat> is the extrication of discretion and replacing it with all kinds of formal rules. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do this. Okay? Now, I'm not knocking bureaucracy. Okay? Bu bureaucracy has its place. But it is not to be confused with entrepreneurship. <laughs> So bureaucracy has its place. It's a great thing to have. Whenever we're talking about what government's doing for people, you do not want discretion. Just, you know, government's about power. You never want to put power and discretion together, ever. All right? Uh, I've actually done some work on bureaucracy for Oliver. You know, Oliver Williamson's always trying to give you these projects to do, and to come up with a theory of bureaucracy. I said, okay, well, I guess I can come up with a theory of bureaucracy if you want to. And the bottom line is when you're talking about things that government is doing. Uh, for or in conjunction with people, you and, and people complain about how inefficient it is because you hear this all the time. I can't believe the government's so stupid they do that. And I said, No, you got it wrong, partner. The way the government doesn't do stupid stuff is it forgets about rules and does the thing that makes the most sense in the moment. That's called discretion. And a government that gives its uh, bureaucrats discretion is called a banana republic. So you don't want that. So what I would say is, in, in the real world, most of the world is low trust as a result 
They can't deal with golden opportunities. As a result, they don't just take it on the chin. Their firms are smaller, their firms are less complex, and the institutions within the firm are more suffocating. Simple example, Japan. I've done some work on Japan. Japan's a cool country. Love Japan. Hard-working people. Yeah, you're going to find a smarter people. Good luck with that. Smart, hard-working, blah, blah, blah. Right. Name me one steam engine. One. The Japanese are very self-aware of a thoroughgoing lack of creativity. Why? I mean, they, this just drives them crazy. They have done everything they can to make their people more creative. Why aren't they more creative? Because Japan is a low trust society. Most Americans go, well, wait a minute, that don't make any sense. Even Frank Fukuyama thinks Japan's a high trust society. No, the Japanese people don't think Japan's a high trust society. Very careful studies done by Toshio Yamagishi shows that Japan is in fact a low trust society. Japanese people trust Japanese people less than they trust Americans. It is, in fact, a low-trust society. So what goes on in Japan? It's a low-trust society. So behavior is very heavily regulated by institutions. What does that do? Well, if you live in that kind of society, doing something different, doing something that deviates from the norm is a great way to say, hey, I'm over here up to no good. So what do, you par what do your parents teach you in Japan? You stay in the line. You do what you're told. You follow the protocol. You don't make mistakes. You get it right the first time. There's a <clears throat> thoroughgoing regimentation that occurs at a very young age, and it continues all the way through high school. And by the time these kids get to college, it's just too late. Their ability to be thoroughly creative is just sucked right out of them. Why? Because of the regimentation of institutionalization, which is in turn a result of the inability to trust people. This inability to trust people, which is in turn a result of moral beliefs, is a very, very, very deep problem. There is a reason why the vast majority of societies, even today, are not worth living in. Very, very few of them have all of this. Is, it, is there an evolution? Yeah. Oh, uh, he was next. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Well, can you name a country or a society or uh, an industry where your philosophy prevails? It's kind of a loaded question. Um, my work really isn't normative. Uh, in other words, I'm just trying to figure stuff out. I mean, what, what propelled the book was a simple question that launched a thought experiment. If a society's sole objective was to maximize general prosperity and it could choose the moral beliefs of the people who comprised it, what does moral beliefs look like? It's not truly an exercise in morality. I mean, in a, in a very weird sense, see the irony here? It is an utterly consequentialist exercise that identifies a non-consequentialist moral ethic. You talk about weird, but I've been accused of being weird before. Now, that, that question that you're asking is more like a, a, a Weberian approach. Max Weber, the sociologist from the turn of the century, he was looking at different societies and their performance and different kinds of moral beliefs and trying to match up the characteristics, which is cool stuff, but that's not what I do. <laughs> However, in the spirit of answering your question and the spirit intended, it is nevertheless true that a testable implication of what I'm doing is that societies whose moral beliefs comport most closely with the moral foundation of how I identified it should do the best. Now, I don't do anything like that in the book because that is a whole new quagmire. But I am working on a book titled uh, The Role of Culture, wait, no, what is it? A Cultural Explanation for the Rise of the West. It's really what? A Cultural Explanation for the Rise of the West. In other words, why did the West jump way out ahead? In fact, I got a speaker coming in uh, tomorrow, Bill Kirby, the, uh, the most, uh, probably the most eminent Chinese historian in the world. He's from Harvard. And uh, I wrote a paper years ago on the Kirby puzzle. The Kirby, the Kirby puzzle is, a, is a, a refinement of what's known as an Edom puzzle, which is why the heck is it that China was so far ahead of everybody as late as 1840, and, now, and then they were left in the dust? How could it possibly be? Well, my argument is 
There are societies in our past whose moral beliefs came closer to comporting with the moral foundation than others, and they did in fact do better. And then I explain exactly what moments in history and precisely what little changes in culture opened the floodgates. Um, we, know, we know the usual suspects. England, uh, Holland, <clears throat> Northern Germany. The United States had this, what basically had those, that kind of culture dumped in an open frontier with cheap land. <clears throat> and that's where it all took off. Well, she's paying me, so I gotta. I gotta have to ask for her. Um, do you see any? Since you mentioned you saw turning points in those cultures, right? Are there any potential turning points for our culture right now? Being this yeah, sense? yeah. Um, if you want to rule the world, the last thing on earth you want is decentralized economic activity. Make sense? It, you, you can't rule a society with decentralized activity. So the first step in ruling the world or ruling a society is to centralize economic activity. The first step to centralizing economic activity is to legitimize kind of behaviors like redistribution. Centralizing economic activity is impossible if the state doesn't have the power of redistribution. In the United States of America, taken from one person given to another was quite a crazy loony idea in 1870. Not gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Not here. Not ever. But there were people who uh, were in the progressive movement who had a strong vision of organizing society in a way that they thought was better, and I think they were sincere. They were utopianists. Uh, and they needed to change the moral conversation in our country because the way the ordinary people talk in the United States, there was no way you were going to be able to use government to do what they wanted to do in a progressive movement. So they started chipping away. Uh, they are known as the Fabian Socialists, and they did a fabulous job. I, I did a thing for the Wall Street Journal not too long ago where I argued that we need to do our own Fabianism in the other direction because Fabianism does work. So don't get too far out ahead of yourself. And it was an argument similar to one Fred Barnes had made. Um, but the bottom line is I, I think that in the United States, we have gone perilously down a road that takes us perilously far from the moral foundation. I think the United States of America had prevailing moral beliefs that were not based on a moral foundation. They couldn't have been. I just made it up. Those people were all dead. They couldn't know what I was going to come up with. But they, those moral beliefs did come forth with what they believed. And as a result, over the last 200 years, we've produced the greatest society man has ever known. But we're moving away from that, and it is not accidental. We are systematically teaching our children character and moral education and K-12 education. We are systematically teaching people in business schools through business ethics courses, and we are systematically teaching, another book is the Moral Foundation of Rule of Law, by the way, we are systematically <laughs> teaching people in law school moral beliefs based on social justice theory, which is completely at war with the Moral Foundation. We, we are not unwinding the Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior in this country to entropy. We're grabbing the string and we're yanking it. And we're yanking it hard. And the people who are yanking it know exactly what we're doing. Is that good or bad? That's terrifying. In the United States, trust since 1950 has gone down dramatically. This is documented from Robert Putnam. You ever hear of the book Bowling Alone? Kind of a big, that, that's Bob Putnam. Now Bob, by the way, loves this book. So, you know, we got this weird crossover of, of, of people. but. Um, trust has plummeted in the West, it's plummeted in the United States. Uh, you guys, every three months you see something on Yahoo or on the news about the rise in cheating among high school students and college students. There's no question that cheating is bad, and there's no question that more cheating is worse. But I submit to you that the most terrifying thing of all about these cheating reports is what the students say. Go back 50 years. 50 years is not that long ago. If, if a student had self-reported that he had cheated, and you said, oh, by the way, we saw it as yourself, so, so why did you cheat or whatever? The student would say, well, you know. 
they would admit that they cheated. They would admit that cheating is wrong. There'd be no question that cheating was wrong. And then they would explain their action by saying, I was, I was weak. I mean, I was just, I was behind the eight ball. I was going to get thrown out of school. I didn't know what to do. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. But, but I did it. Students today, the, we're talking about on the order of 70% who self-report that they cheat and are asked why, they say, I don't see how this is wrong. Nobody's getting hurt. Sounds like harm-based moral restraint, doesn't it? These are precisely the people that if we are going to have large yet entrepreneurial firms where we fully delegate the ability to make this, uh, decisions all the way up and down the firm's hierarchy, these are the people that we're going to be trusting to not take advantage of every golden opportunity that comes along. Or we won't be. And if you look at corporations in the United States, you know, when we hear the word bureaucracy, the older you are, the more likely when you hear the word bureaucracy you think government. The younger you are, the more likely when you hear the word bureaucracy you think corporation. Really? Now, our corporations are getting increasingly bureaucratic. Why? Because we can't allow things to be unwritten. We can't just depend on the good judgment and moral restraint of the people who make these decisions. We just have to have a million rules in there so we can take care of it through overt institutions. Well, if you're doing that, then you're chopping off action space that allows people to do what needs to be done to maximize the firm's profits. It is antithetical to entrepreneurship. We are turning ourselves into Japan. And Japan's not a bad thing to be if there's an America to free ride off of. But if you're the, if you're the top dog and there's nobody else to free ride off of, that's not going to work for you. We're over time, but I know I have one more question. Can you? Well, I can't ask the question. What's the name of your book? <coughs> uh, which book? Which, uh, any, any, the book you've been talking about. Well, the current book is The Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior. The next two books are Capitalism, Freedom, and Trust which makes an argument for modern property rights theory to explain why the three are not coincidental, they're connected in a deep way. The one that's after that, or being co-written with that, is the moral case for capitalism. <laughs> so uh, depending upon how much support I get, I will get those books done either simultaneously or in sequence fast. So China's going to help me with that, I think. That, with well, I, was, I followed your speech all along, but the punchline to me was missing, which is, that, I what, is the last answer, yeah. what is the answer, in other words, if, if we need to be taught uh, the case you gave, like why it's wrong to cheat on your income taxes if it doesn't really hurt anybody, right. we, have, we don't understand that and everybody needs to, we're right. kind of left on what do we need to do to do that. In other words, what is the solution to the issue that you raised? Right. Well, the book is a, an academic exercise. I'm just trying to uncover truth, and when I find truth is not there, it's kind of a win all by itself. But having said that, having said that, the first step to re if we're going to talk about the practical problem of what's happening in the United States and our concern, I would argue that the first step is to explain to people, particularly people who teach character and morals and education at K through 12 level exactly what they're getting into when they adopt what is really just an atavism, act utilitarianism, which is the, really, that's all that social justice theory is. It's just act utilitarianism. This idea that rules don't matter, what matters is what happens at the margin, and they're trying to do the greatest good for the greatest number, which requires your own individual judgment. In the book, I work out exactly how that falls apart. Because what that does is it treats all moral values as being on the same number line. I see. So in other words, you are trying to get people to know how morals really work. And that right. you're saying that people look at it the wrong way. If you they need to look at it the right way, if, the way you're interpreting it. Right. If you want to live in a high-trust society, you and the people around <coughs> you don't want to think about morality this way, where all moral values are the same, it's just a matter of, they're, they're, they're qualitatively the same, so they're the same in kind, they only differ in degree in algebraic sign, positive moral action, positive, negative is negative sign. If that's all there is to it, then you can see how great a good rationalization, you can rationalize anything in that world, and if you can rationalize anything, you can't trust each other. 
Once you've destroyed that, then you can come back and say, well, what kind of moral beliefs allow us to trust each other? Most people don't need a great deal of persuasion that it's better to live in a society where other people will trust you automatically and where you aren't foolish to trust other people. So that's kind of like a primitive that would resonate even with children. So I think it can be done. David, we really appreciate your talk. It was fascinating. Thank you. My pleasure.